mild-mannered man discovers his wife is cheating, an American family about to be destroyed. Thomas said, if I can't have her, no one will. And he killed her. No one can have Lisa now because Thomas pulled that trigger. A proud, serving US Navy man is forced to face a violent truth. His father has killed his mother. He is now part of the collateral damage. Dad did what he did, mom did what she did. They're both bad things. But I can't really say I love one more than the other, even after everything that happened. You just can't take sides. The Infantes, a modern tragedy made in the USA. A leafy Connecticut neighborhood, a picture book house, a family, mum, dad and four children grew up here. Then one day, one of them hears the dog scratching at his mom's bedroom door. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Someone wants to find out what's going on. So when he walks down the hall to the master bedroom and he opens the door, because why does their dog want inside so badly? And what he sees is his mom lying on the bed face down, blood coming out of the back of her head. She's been shot once in the head, and she's dead. A frantic 911 call is made. It's that of a teenager reporting that he went into his mom's bedroom and he found his mom dead, panicked and so the police respond. Now living away, the eldest son gets a call. I couldn't find my keys, jumped in my fiance's car. Uh, I didn't think I had shoes on, <laughs> uh, but rushed over to my house and the whole street was lined with neighbors and police and like friends of the family. Murder had come calling to Shelton, a place where people live to avoid violent crime. Why was Lisa Infante dead on her bed, the scent of her blood attracting the family dog? Lisa Ann Swanson and Thomas J. Infante Jr. were married on the 25th of June 1988 in the wealthy suburban town of Monroe, Connecticut. They were 25 years old. Guests walking into the church that day didn't have to worry about which side of the aisle to sit on because everybody at the wedding knew pretty much everyone else. They, they met when they were kids. They grew up together. They were almost like, you know, super close friends. In fact, as teenagers, Tom and Lisa had lived just four houses away from each other on the Monroe Turnpike, a tree-lined avenue on the northern edge of the town. They both attended the same high school, a stone's throw from their homes. They graduated in the class of 1980. I know my Uncle Rich and my dad were really close. Um, and same with my aunt and my dad. Everyone was just like, we were all a pretty close family. Tom Infante's family was well established in Monroe. His father, also Thomas, had a successful construction and property development business, as had his father before him. Lisa was also from a tight-knit, happy family. Her mother, Elizabeth, and father, Harry, were doting parents to her and her younger sister, Lynn. Despite all that they shared, Lisa and Tom were very different kinds of people. Lisa was known as an upbeat person. She's the kind of person that every time you would see her, she would smile at you. My dad was, he kind of liked to be like, you know, the guy in the corner just like hanging out with his group. Didn't really like to be like center of attention. Three years into their marriage, their first child came along, a son called Vincent. Then followed three more, Harrison, Matt, and Kayla. Tom and Lisa deeply loved their children. That everybody could see. The Infantes were animal lovers. They adored cats and dogs. It was in many ways a hustling, bustling, happy home. Lisa and Thomas had four kids. They had one daughter and three sons. Uh, the daughter was especially close to the father. 
you know, he was just you know, your typical dad, uh, emotional at times. Uh, he was actually pretty emotional. Um, he would cry over songs. and We had these little chihuahuas. He, he would love them, love to hold them. Um, it, uh, he was very, just an emotional guy, sensitive. But even as a young child, it was clear to Vinny that his mum and dad's approach to parenting were poles apart. My mom was usually pretty laid back. Uh, like she was like in the yoga and uh, uh, never really hard going. Dad was kind of more strict about things. Uh, like, like, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that kind of thing. She was loving and giving, and you could kind of tell that in her profession. She was a nutritionist, also a yoga instructor, but she also volunteered her time as an EMS technician, emergency medical services. So you could see the kind of personality she was and what she chose to do with her life. She was an EMT, so she really like cared about people, cared about their well-being. It was in 2010 that Lisa qualified as a yoga instructor quit her job, began teaching full time. She taught a form of exercise called Holy Fit that said it combined Christian devotion with fitness. I think she uh, helped out the community, helped out people. Um, she was awesome. Me and her got along really well. We would do yoga together. She's uh, very caring, very compassionate, um, really loved us kids, um, great cook. Um, we'd always come home and she'd have something waiting for us, like brownies or cookies or something. <laughs> Thomas Infante, meanwhile, had become an equipment operator for the public works department in the neighboring town of Trumbull. If you get him doing what he liked, uh, he was a great guy to be around. Uh, funny, uh, liked to tell jokes, good sense of humor. And then we would always hang out with Dad, like um, go out on car trips, go pick up a new tractor or something. So dad would always like bring home stuff for me and my brother to, to work on and play with. Kind of like, like big toys kind of thing. So it was like a hobby. We would restore them, uh, work on the engines, drive them around. Me and my brother would have like tractor races in the yard. A little redneck, but uh, it, it was fun for us. It was by no means an unhappy childhood for the Infanti siblings, but even as kids, they were aware that their parents were not a match made in heaven. All four of the kids, it's clear, had witnessed a, a lot of angst in this marriage. There, were, there was a lot of fighting going on from the time they were little because it pretty much uh, spanned their whole lifetime. I mean, I, I just, their personalities grew apart. Um, I think they kind of settled for each other because they were friends, they were neighbors. But um, that never gave them the opportunity to grow as a person, individually, and experience those breakups and other people, which every healthy relationship and person kind of needs to go through, I think. The beautiful home became a place of tension. I mean, me and my brother, we, uh, I mean, all my siblings, we always like tend to get in trouble, always fight with each other, typical sibling stuff. Mom would yell, Dad would yell. You know, we get sent to our room, kind of thing. Get grounded. Neither one were like super, super strict, like belting you or anything. Thomas was uh, dark, angry. Uh, he had a quick temper, and he was known to sometimes get violent when he had his outbursts. It was like bickering, just like little stuff. Like I thought it was just stupid stuff they would always fight about. But uh, I, I guess that all build up, build up, build up, and it just turned into something big. You know, they, they don't talk about physical abuse. They don't talk about beatings. They talk about hurting each other. My parents always were fighting. They were always abusing each other. They were, there was a lot of pain on both sides, is what the daughter said later in court. According to Karen Jarmuk of the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the pattern of behavior inside the Infanti household was typical of an abuser. It's the threats, the harassment, uh, isolating someone from their family, friends, co-workers, uh, using coercion and control to try to really take control over that, your partner. So many people think domestic violence and they think of a black eye or a broken uh, limb, and, and it can be that, but generally it's just much more subliminal 
she had posted on her own social media about how abusive mentally her husband could be. It's that very under the surface stuff that may or may not have been occurring in this relationship around the subliminal power and control the person's trying to have over the other. And when they start to lose that, it can become very, very dangerous. Lisa and Thomas had been married for 27 years. You think, wow, they've weathered a lot. But this was not a good marriage, and apparently not from the get-go. It was filled with, you know, fighting and abuse, verbal, perhaps uh, physical. Everybody said that this, from the very start, had its problems, but they stuck together. As the years passed, Lisa and Thomas Infante had muddled along, being the best parents they could, staying together for the sake of their shared history and for the family. But this was a marriage that seemed destined to end badly. Lisa finally at one point had had enough. After 27 years of marriage, she started telling friends she was done. She decided it was over. She was gonna take charge of her life. She was ready to move on. It's the most dangerous time for any female when they finally made the decision to leave. After 27 years of marriage, four children raised, tensions were out in the open in the Infante household. Some home truths were becoming clear. I know they were seeing a couple's therapists, which I don't think helped at all. <laughs> I think it made things worse, honestly. Lisa's sister, Lynn Everlilth, was never a big fan of Thomas Infante. She really didn't want them to get married to begin with. She said their marriage had been strained right from the get-go. She said those children had been raised in a really toxic environment. And she says that he was just a miserable person to be around. He was never pleasant to be around. I think mom was more of a, a gradual change. Uh, you can kind of see her, you know, veer in a way, you know, throughout the years. Dad always, you know, tried to do the best he could. But, I mean, I, I just, their personalities grew apart. Other factors familiar to millions of families were in play. In the previous two years, Tom's father had died, as had both of Lisa's parents. One day, Lisa Infante dropped a bombshell. She told her husband that she had met someone. She told her that she wanted a divorce, and, um, According to her, she uh, had told her friends, apparently, uh, that she had already hired a divorce attorney, and she was ready, and she was starting to make plans. But uh, at a certain point, he just was like, Mom's cheating on me, and like, kind of threw me back, because, I mean, they've been my parents together for the whole 20 years of my life. Lisa really was ready. After 27 years, she'd had it, she'd seen what life could be like, a glimmer of it anyway, because she'd met this person that made her feel good. She was tired of the anger and all the time fighting. So she said, you know, I'm done. And like she would go over, hang out with this guy, make dinner for his kids. And it was just, I'm like, just why would you do that, Mom? You know, you got a great family, you have a great house. Uh, I mean, I, I guess she wasn't happy. She went up to me when she was talking about it. She was like, don't you want me to be happy? And that kind of threw me for a loop because I didn't know how to answer the question. I'm like, of course I want you to be happy, Mom. The remodeled Lisa's mind was made up, but Thomas Infante struggled to come to terms with the total breakdown of his marriage. I was pretty close to him, so I could see the good, bad, and ugly. So uh, I know like when I was down in Florida with the Navy, he would call me up and he would just be like crying his eyes out about mom. And no kid wants to hear their dad cry, you know? You could just see dad deteriorating. Like he was just depressed. He would just call me upset in weird times of the night. And then once I got home from the Navy, uh, after a long nine months of being away, you think you want to hang out with your kid. He didn't even want to do that. I tried to get him up, tried to like bring him to like county fairs or something, and he just would not get out of bed. He was like a blob. <laughs> and um, 
I thought he was just kind of being a sissy about the whole thing. And I, I really did not know what was going through his head. Thomas, you know, he still loved his wife. He may have been a mean and angry guy. He may have abused her, but he still considered, this is my wife. She belongs to me and no one else should have her. He didn't necessarily voice that to her. He would talk to her about, let's not get divorced. He would kind of plead with her, but she had made up her mind. Dad didn't really have that personality where he would actually go out and like talk to a therapist or something. I think he went to a doctor and they gave him some antidepressants. Who knows if those were good for him? Probably not. He was never the kind of guy who would actually take pills. He wouldn't even take aspirin for a headache. The domestic violence campaigner Karen Jomak by telling Thomas that she had planned to leave, Lisa was entering very dangerous territory. That's a really, really critical dangerous time because then they start losing their control uh, and things begin to unravel. So we always know, uh, and that's I think what's so tragic and sad uh, when a domestic violence homicide occurs because there are always these red flags that aren't always uh, as noticeable uh, to the victim and or to those individuals around them. Um, but when we look back, we, we see them there. She's ready. Thomas isn't, and as we know, in relationships involving abuse, too many times the abuser, the most dangerous time is when the woman decides to leave. And that turns out to be the case for Lisa. 38% of the time when women are murdered, they are murdered by their spouse or loved one, compared to only 6% of men. Oftentimes, as police officers, we say, why don't they just leave? Well, out of those 38% of women who get murdered, nearly 68% of those women are murdered when they finally made the decision to leave. And this was the same case in Shelton, Connecticut. She decided it was over she was going to take charge of her life. It's the most dangerous time for any female or any relationship. Leaving a relationship is a huge risk factor for domestic violence homicide. So she's moving on, he's not. So you can see that in his mind he's thinking, I'm not ready for her to move on. She's ready for her to move on. I don't want anyone to have her. So what is he going to do? Did Lisa Infante have any idea of the danger that she was in? Lisa had a, a Facebook account, and on her Facebook page, you could often see she was one of those people that loved those motivational sayings, you know, if, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. Uh, happiness is your birthright. She liked that kind of stuff, and usually it was positive. But there was this one post that she made that really got people's attention because it really wasn't like her. And she's posting about giving people a second chance and she's warning against it. If you give a person a second chance, it's like giving them another bullet to put in the gun. Whether or not she feared her husband, it seems that Lisa was counting down the days until she could start afresh with her new partner. She's making plans. She is arranging her bank account. She's becoming financially independent. And she's also, she's a yoga instructor and she's also kind of stepping up her own routine because she wants to get in shape for this new life she's planning uh, and this new person that she plans to be with. When Vinny returned from the Navy on leave in the summer of 2015, he could hardly recognize what his family had become. My mom was never home. She was either always working or working. You know, seeing this guy and then dad was just so depressed he didn't want to do anything didn't want to hang out with us and then I just remember getting angry at her for never being around because I'm like mom I haven't seen you in months almost a year and you're just not here I, like I miss you it, it was just it was rough because you know they were doing their own thing and I, I just wanted some family time did the family fear that dad might turn rough? Knowing him for the first 20 years of my life, 20 plus years of my life, he was not like that. He wouldn't even go hunting with me. He would get too sensitive. Oh, I don't want to kill any deers. I don't want to kill Bambi. So like, he was just a sensitive guy. It's just not something he would do. But I guess you put so much on someone and anyone can break.
on September 27th, 2015, in a small New England town of Shelton, Connecticut. The peace and quiet of this small town was interrupted. It was interrupted by a single gunshot inside a family home. Late sometime in the evening, uh, I get a call from my little brother, and which is unusual, because Matt usually never calls me. And I pick up, and he's like, Vinny, you gotta come home, mom's dead. But in that moment, where's the husband? Where's the father of the children? He has fled. He has grabbed alcohol, he has grabbed medication, and he's gone. The previous evening, Lisa and Tom had managed to keep up appearances as they marked an important milestone with their eldest son. It was my fiance's birthday party. Uh, my parents came. First time that my parents met her parents. Um, I stayed over her house that night, hung out with her the whole day because it was her birthday. So Thomas is at work. Lisa puts the kids to bed. She gets dinner on, she feeds the kids, she kisses them goodnight, puts them to bed. She goes to her own bedroom. Not much unlike many other homes across the United States. You have a wife in her master bedroom, her children, whether they're on their phones, watching TV, it's life. It was a life about to end in the marital bed. Hours after she had settled down, Lisa Infante was dead. No one wanted to believe it. Was it suicide? Detectives began developing theories. So what has happened? It tells a story. When you look at the body positioning, the way the body is twisted on that bed, the door to the master bedroom opens, the victim sees who their assailant is, probably knows who their assailant is. He's made sure he has ammunition for his gun. He has mapped out an escape route. She knows that whoever came into this room is coming with a purpose. And it wasn't long. It was fast. It was quick. It was efficient. And so she turns. And that is why she's shot in the back of her head. Thomas Infante shot Lisa dead, his wife of 27 years, and left her for her teenage children to find. It was definitely hard. I know my siblings had totally different experiences. I know um, Harrison and Matt actually like found her. I'm not sure if Kayla uh, witnessed it. I hope not, uh, but I know I didn't. It was probably for the best. I don't know if I can handle seeing my mother that way. Once Thomas kills her, once he shoots her and he knows she's dead, he leaves. He grabs some pills, he grabs some alcohol, he takes off and he hits the road. The whole day, it was kind of a blur, because it was just totally life-changing. You know, like, instantaneously, I didn't have my mother. Had no clue of what happened to my father. And I can only go on assumptions at that point. This small town, this kind of crime doesn't happen in Shelton, Connecticut. But that peace and quiet, it's that 911 call of a son discovering the body of his own mother. I did not believe it at all. I thought, if anything, she committed suicide. Because um, I know she was going through a lot, uh, a lot of tr like, between her boyfriend and the divorce. When police arrived on the scene, they too were rapidly trying to make sense of the situation, something former homicide detective Brian Harris has experienced all too many times. One of the things as a homicide detective you're looking for is, is this a staged event? Is it an organized scene versus disorganized? Was there a sign of a struggle? Was there a fight? Uh, are there pieces of furniture knocked over? What is happening? One thing they knew for certain, Lisa's husband was nowhere to be seen. I mean, I had no clue what was going on. I tried calling my dad like a million times, could not get him on the phone. The detectives, they want to find Thomas. He's clearly a person of interest. They need to find out, where is he? 
Through all of this, where is he? Turns out Thomas had hit the road. They track his cell phone and they see that he is already in Pennsylvania. And then all of a sudden the phone goes dead. Somebody turned it off or the battery died. As police organized an urgent search for Thomas Infanta, the scenes of crime officers were quickly reaching their own conclusions. This crime scene, like many others, the evidence that is left behind is part of a bigger story. So there is a shell casing, a 380 shell casing that is left behind. They didn't have time to look for that 380 shell casings because when shell casings get ejected, they bounce. They move. Oftentimes that position of that shell casing doesn't necessarily reflect where that person was standing. They can bounce, they can be kicked underneath the bed, but the fact that the shell casing is left there, whoever did this wanted to get out of there. When they interview the two children in the house at the time of the murder, it confirmed their suspicions that the killer was no stranger. This killer did not spend time in this room. There were no drawers gone through. This wasn't a robbery. It was a single shot. The children aren't startled by any strangers in the home. Whoever did this, the children felt comfortable with their presence. Whoever did this, it was a personal attack. And once they did it, they knew they had to get out of there. The whole family was distraught. Nobody really knew what was going on. Nobody knew where dad was. Uh, I think after a while, we kind of like figured it out. Um, at first, you know, I can only, I thought it was like, I don't know, like her boyfriend did it or, because I, I couldn't think that dad would do it. Their prime suspect on the run and fearful for what he might do next, police set about tracking down Thomas Infante. They go back to looking for phone signals. And what they're able to do then is track that cell phone and they're following the signal for that cell phone. Where is it? It's like a homing device, a GPS. And where did they find them? But hundreds, literally hundreds of miles away at the Pennsylvania, Ohio border. While the police are tracking this phone and they're seeing it, it's in Pennsylvania, 200 miles away. They lose the signal. Perhaps the battery's dead, or did this person turn it off? Did they have the mindset, I need to turn my phone off because they can find me that way? They've watched enough TV to know that that can be done. He's almost to the Ohio state line and he realizes, oh gosh, you know, I'm, I'm this, you know, I, I gotta tell him what I did. And lo and behold, at the Shelton Police Department, who walks through their front doors? But Thomas, Thomas himself wearing the same t-shirt with the blood on it, walks in, turns himself into the police. When he shows up there, he's still wearing the same t-shirt he was wearing. It's soaked with his wife's blood. That's up close, that's personal. He didn't just stand at the doorway and fire from a distance. As his wife went to get out of bed, he's not just slowly walking, he's marching towards her gun pointed straight at her and she twists and turns and he puts that gun right up on her. So close that when he pulls the trigger that there is blood that spatters up back onto him. It's that close and personal. Thomas Infante turned himself in but he wasn't ready to admit to the horror, the enormity of what he'd done. He was kind of operating in this like fugue state. So when he hits the road and he finally blacks out and comes to, that's when he realizes he needs to tell police what he did. And that's when he shows up at the police station. He's not ready to take responsibility. You see, he thought he was man enough to do what he did, but he wasn't man enough to accept the responsibility for his actions. So what does he do? He blames it on medicine, alcohol. He blacked out. Remembers going to the house, but after that, it's almost as if it's an outer body experience. He has no recollection of what took place. 
Lisa Infante is dead, her husband Thomas in police custody. He's charged with murder, but he isn't admitting his guilt. He says he had some pills, he had some booze, and at some point he just blacked out. He basically says he didn't really know what he was doing that night. He really didn't know what was going on. You know, just something snapped, some short circuit in his mind. Everything can build up, build up, build up and at a certain point just cracked. Two days after the death of 52-year-old Mama Four Lisa Infante, her estranged husband Tom stood in court charged with first-degree murder. He admitted nothing, though detectives claimed that privately he told them he had shot her during an argument. After almost three years in the Northern Correctional Institution in Summers, Connecticut, his trial date came around. So Thomas has pled not guilty, and his trial is about to begin. They're going to go into jury selection, but on the eve of his trial, he decides to take a plea. And Thomas pleads to a reduced charge. It doesn't fall on deaf ears to the prosecutors, to the defense team, about the staggering domestic violence stats that are out there. It doesn't fall on deaf ears that the victim herself, her life, she will be judged about the choices that she made, not only to leave her husband, but that she was ready to move on. And what kind of picture were they gonna paint? That she was some Harlequin that was having an affair? But then also a lot of things came out of the woodwork afterwards, finding out that she cheated on dad. 15 years prior with the same guy. So, I mean, I guess my parents did a good job at uh, covering things up. You see, in life, but also in death, we have to treat our victims with dignity. And this was the chance for the state to treat the victim with dignity, while at the same time issuing punishment to the perpetrator. He pleads to first degree manslaughter committed under extreme emotional disturbance. So this, we can imagine, is the mitigating factor which is going to affect how he's sentenced. In court, Tom's lawyer argued for a lenient sentence. His client, he said, had been under intense pressure in the weeks and months leading up to the crime, something that Tom's son, Vinny, could attest to. My sister, I think a couple weeks before everything happened, I, I guess she was doing some off-roading on her dirt bike, um, hit a fence, uh, from what I've heard went over the handlebars and the handlebar like stabbed her in the stomach. And uh, so my mom was working, she picked her up in the ambulance and uh, she was with her the whole, the whole thing. That was really hard for dad. I know he was in the hospital with her almost every day, so was mom. And uh, so that was really hard in the whole family. In the same month, one of Tom's sons ended up in hospital after a quad biking accident. Same time period. My brother was up in Maine and got into a quadding accident, and so he was in the hospital. It was just a really hard time for Dad, seeing th at three of his kids away from him, two of them in a hospital, like, uh, and then you know, between Mom cheating on him and him hating his job and everything else going on in his life. I mean, a guy can only take so much, the way I look at it. It's like his whole world was falling apart. Devastated, bereaved, still some of Thomas Infante's children refused to accept that their father was an abusive killer. The daughter would testify that while her, her father really loved her mother, but she could not remember a time when the couple ever got along. And that seemed to be backed up by a lot of people. Some people think that there's sides to the whole thing, like you're either on mom's side or you're on dad's side which is totally not the case, because I know at least in my shoes, I love both of them equally. You know, they're my parents. I can't take sides. I, mean, I know dad did what he did, mom did what she did. Um, they're both bad things. But I can't really, you know, say I love one more than the other, even after everything happened. You just can't take sides to the whole circumstance.
The daughter's very close to dad. She's very defensive. And she says, you know, dad just wanted to be loved. That's all he wanted. He just wanted to be cared for. He loved my mom. They never got along. I just, I can't remember a time when they ever got along. There was a lot of abuse. There was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of pain on both sides. But daddy always loved mom. Prosecutors had little sympathy with this version of events. Witnesses described Thomas Infante as unpleasant, violent, even abusive, and described Lisa as a woman who was ready, finally, to break free of a toxic marriage. She was a mother that was in a relationship crisis. She had come to a point in her life where she had made the decision that this marriage to her husband was indeed going to end. She was ready to move on and even had found another love interest. There's always a history, and there's always a history. This just doesn't extemporaneously occur one day. Um, there's always a history, and generally it's some kind of a buildup. Thomas was a dark and sullen character. He was depressed, but some of that depression, I think you could argue, was of his own making. He didn't take steps to change, uh, and he didn't ask for help. This is not behavior that you can blame on, oh, so-and-so was drinking that day. Yes, okay, they may have been drinking that day, but that behavior has to exist in that individual before. In fact, according to prosecutors, there was evidence that the killing was premeditated. This is a man that had to leave a location where he was, because he was no longer in the home, came in the home, knew his children were going to be in there, He's made sure that he has ammunition for his gun. Fired one round. So he brought a weapon into the home. He coldly grabbed a gun and held it to her head and pulled the trigger and ripped her life away. Then takes medicine, takes alcohol, and tries to flee. But he quickly realizes the gig is going to go up. It's not a crime of passion because he never claims that. He never paints himself as a victim. What does he do instead? I blacked out. I have no recollection. I can't remember. I don't recall. It's the big blackout bad guy defense. It's not a crime of passion. This was well thought out. It was premeditated. Now how it was executed? A poor plan. But he darn sure knew what he was doing. He got his way. Thomas said, if I can't have her, no one will, and he killed her. No one can have Lisa now, because Thomas pulled that trigger. Thomas made the ultimate decision. When he sentenced Thomas Infante, Superior Court Judge Frank Yanotti told him that people, for the most part, don't take the life of other people. It's a shame, he said, that you couldn't keep the photographs of your four children in your head and understand what was happening. Thomas Infante was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Some of his term will be suspended after 25 years. He will remain in jail until he's over 80 years old, at least 25 calendar years before he's even eligible for parole. For many family members, they're not just losing the person who was murdered, they're also losing the perpetrator because they are uh, often going to prison. What no homicide detective can explain is how a father can do this to his own kid's mom. That can't be explained. People often talk about quick closure, that there's closure when a homicide case is solved. There's never any closure. It was definitely hard to get through it. It was a lot all at once and <laughs> Like nobody should ever go through that, especially like like kids our age. You know, no matter what age you are, I guess it's hard. Some forgive dad, some don't. Some can talk to him, some can't. Um, it, it's just it's just really hard. You can't let it hold you back. If it eats you alive, then, I mean, a lot of people they would just go down the hole and never return. Those children will grow up without a father and the deep wounds and scars of knowing that their mother was murdered 
and that she knew what was coming. It's a lifelong of pain and healing that that family's gonna have to go through. The whole aftermath of it really kind of tore the family apart. Like no one goes to birthday parties or Thanksgivings or Christmases anymore together. I mean, me and my brothers and sisters, we're still really close, which I mean, that's the most important thing to me. Like I wish everybody could work together and be one big happy family again. But I don't think that'll ever be the case. Lisa and Thomas Infante were neighbors, childhood friends, high school sweethearts. They were married for 27 years, but if there was ever a honeymoon period in their marriage, it certainly didn't last long. Angry, depressed, and facing the prospect of losing his wife to divorce, and her seeing another man, Thomas Infante made the devastating decision to kill her. It's not only a physical prison that he is in forever, until he's in his 80s, he will have to live with the fact that he destroyed not just his wife, but his children's lives as well. And he has to live with that. Every day he wakes up and every day he goes to bed. That's what his legacy is. For her children, memories of Lisa Infante are bittersweet. The way I want my mother to be remembered is not that she cheated on my dad, because that, that's not her personality. It's like she was an EMT, I think she uh, helped out the community, helped out people. I, I would just like people to know her as a, like a loving mother, uh, as, a, as a great person, um, great personality, awesome to hang out with. I uh, even actually miss shopping with her, just like grocery shopping. And I really just took that for granted uh, growing up. <laughs> but now there's like nothing I wouldn't do just to go grocery shopping with her again.